Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, let me start with a brief introduction of basic concept. Um, the space of the um, solar system is not empty at all. It's plenty of other objects uh, in addition to star, star and planets. Uh, other small bodies like uh, asteroids that are rocky or metal bodies uh, from one, kilo one meter to up to 1,000 kilometers. Also, a uh, comet that are formed by dust, uh, ice mantle, and organic matter. And these two bodies can suffer different um, disruption process, like collision with other objects, sublimation, sublimation when they approach the sun, and um, it occurs the gushing of the ice. Also, um, a lot of um, asteroids are rubble piles, so they can suffer tidal refracting um, when they approach or when they uh, fly by. In, to the, uh, a big planet, for example, or even if they are a uh, rubble pine and they have fast rotation, they, got, they can fragment it. So when they fragment it, when this uh, disruption process occurs, they uh, produce the metroid. Um, they are called metroid if they are from 10 of micrometer up to one meter. So if uh, one day when this uh, metroid um, impact the Earth at hyper, hyper velocity, usually from 11 kilometers per second up to 72 uh, kilometers per second. It occurs the process we call it ablation. Ablation is the, is the um, evaporation, uh, ionization of the external layout of the, of the metroid when they impact the iron molecule. And in this process, it generates the uh, luminous column. It's what we call the metroid, it's the metroid itself. So the, it depends on the magnitude of the brightness of this uh, column. Uh, we refer to fireball, bolide, or even super bolide if it can be detected from space. The periodical, the periodical encounter of the Earth uh, with a uh, metroid, uh, associate metroid to the same uh, parent body is what we call the metroid shower. If a metroid uh, survive this process, this ablation process, and reach the, the Earth's surface, then it becomes the meteorite. So for, to, to give um, some data, uh, 40,000 of uh, tons per year are, uh, are new material coming to the earth. And 3% of this material only reach the ground. And the 95% of the mass are lost in the ablation process. So we can uh, be aware of the big opportunity that we have with this incoming material, because we are receiving uh, some material from asteroid and comet. And of course, obviously, uh, the, the smaller the mass particle, the, the more frequently the, the impact the, the atmosphere of the Earth. But also, we receive some uh, material from other planetary surface, like uh, Mars or even the Moon. Uh, this occurs because uh, the Moon of, or, or Mars are exposed to uh, asteroid impact. Uh, in the crater formation, they eject uh, some material to the space. Uh, and in a speed uh, greater than the escape velocity, so they can eventually reach the um, reach the, the Earth. So uh, why 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 study mineral bodies then? Because uh, historically, uh, because we uh, wanted to give a rational explanation of the meteoric phenomenon. But the, one of the uh, key points also is to recover the press metroid to study them in the laboratory or because they, they can give us cl uh, clues and hints of the solar system formation process. But also, uh, even if we don't um, recover any meteorite, we can do a spectroscopy of the meteor and, and also gain inside of the, of the chemical abundance and the, and the composition. But also, is, uh, the study of inner bodies is uh, crucial for planetary defense deflection strategy because we, if we characterize the the minor bodies, the, the, the structure, the mechanical response, we can improve our, our deflection ability, uh, capability in case we need to deflect an asteroid. Also, it's important to, to for impact hazard assessment of large metroid that can pose a, a potential risk for, for human, and also to understand the delivery of volatiles and water to Earth. So for this purpose, it, it was funded in, in 2005, the Spanish Meteor Network, Red Investigación de Bolios y Meteoritos in Spanish. It was funded by Professor Dr. Jose Maria Trigo Rodriguez. He is a principal investigator of the Meteorite and Mineral Bodies and Planetary Science Group from the Institute of Space Science. 
And this year we are celebrating the 25th anniversary. The, the Spanish Metro Network is composed by 34 stations all, with all sky CCTV camera or wide field videos. Some of them have spectrometers and also we have three scatter radar stations. You can see uh, the Spanish Metro Network cover the whole Spanish territory, Canary Island also, and Balears. Uh, some of the millstone of the Spanish Metro Network, uh, the very famous Villalbeto de la Peña meteorite, it was the first recovery and characterization of a meteorite in 57 years in Spain, and the ninth orbit of the meteorite in the whole world. It was identified as a L6 chondrite. And also, uh, three years later, the Puerto La Vice meteorite, it was an accretive meteorite and it was associated to Vesta. And also, in two, in, as you can read in the last line, in two, uh, 2009, the Colombia meteorite uh, named Cali, and also in 2010, the Verdu from Argentina, in 2014, uh, the Ardon L L600. It was uh, there were named by the Spanish Meteor Network team. Who is in the Spanish Meteor Network? It's a very big project formed with a professional amateur uh, team. Uh, some of the scientific uh, people who are working are um, scientists, are uh, geophysics, are biologists, chemistry engineers, physicists. But also we come uh, with the collaboration of uh, many amateur people that are, have been doing a, a really amazing job during the, the, the last years. And also we are in close cooperation with the French network free fund. In the link uh, I leave below, you can find the updated list of the last volume in, in recorded by the Spanish Metro Network and it, ha it has been updated since 1999. So as I said, one of the uh, Key, one of the purpose of studying the mineral bodies is to do the impact hazard assessment. So in order to do that, uh, we need to combine three uh, different areas. So we need the metric science to characterize the composition and the structure of the of, of these bodies. Also the metric fate, study metric fate, that is if the metric is going to uh, penetrate the, the atmosphere and it's going to uh, produce some risk because the shock wave of the heat or even for impact and also the electric orbit the studies that is going to give us the information about the origin of this meteorite so we need in in some way to record this event and reduce this data and extract this um, physical parameter in order to study impact hazard so for um, for this purpose we have developed the um, the software 3d firetop from three-dimensional firewall uh, trajectory and orbital calculator. It's a Python, automatic Python code. And I present here the main step of the software. First, um, we, we, we do the metro detection. That is, uh, we process the frames that appear the metro and we, uh, we extract the position of the, the metro in the pixel position of the metro. So once we have this, we need to identify the stars in the field of view in order to uh, convert, in, in order to transform the pixel coordinate to real world coordinate. And then when we have this real world coordinate, we have transferred the pixel to the position in the sky. We can reconstruct the atmospheric trajectory and finally the orbit to do, to do this. We use a computer vision technique. Also, we, we apply photometry with uh, corrections. We model the less distortion and we apply stereoscopic methods that I, I'm going to explain now. So the detection here, I was in a diagram for, from the detection process. Here is the, first we have the video, the CCD video, and we uh, look over the frame. So we process it frame. First, we, we measure the pixel mean intensity. If it if, 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 if exceeds a threshold, it's rejected because that means that the, the frame is going to be, the image is going to be saturated, so we cannot extract any valuable information. But um, if, if not, we, we start processing. So we convert to grayscale in order to do a fast processing. We clean the noise with a Gaussian blue filter, and we perform an absolute um, operation. That is, um, we compare the, the, the frame with our reference frame that we know uh, already there is no, no measure. So in this way, in this way, we can we can extract the 
the new pixel activate uh, that potentially could, could be associated to the measure. So we apply some morphological um, operation like dilatation to improve the, the, the fine contour algorithm that we are going to apply now for, 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 for find the, the measure. Why a fine control algorithm? This is an algorithm that has to to step first. Uh, it detects the it detects the edge of the of the image. That is the array of pixels that has a sharp a, a sharp change in the in the values. And then it compute what of uh, these uh, edge are close, uh, because we are looking for a for a um, for a close area because the matter is going has is a short, so it appears like a, a circle or most, most, more or less a, a circle delimited by the edge. Then we discriminate by side because we don't want a very large uh, areas and or even um, very small. And the final uh, contour we compute the centroid in order to to get the um, the, um, the position, the real position of the metroid. But in this process we have um, we are exposed to a fault positive uh, fault positive that we have to avoid. So we implement two different methods. One is a is online method in the in a real time, it's a common filter. Uh, that is a, a, a filter, is a common filter, is a model that fit with the first detected point and predict uh, the next area of appearance with the measure. So it restricts the search to this area, avoiding to false positive due to reflection or light pollution. And another um, a false positive avoidance is um, um, a post-processing application of a clustering algorithm that I'm going to explain now. You can hear, as uh, you can see here in the left, uh, the recording, the video, the original video with explosion, the processor in the center, as you can see, uh, there is a lot of false, false positive uh, due to reflection and also because there is an obstacle, there is a tree. So um, we need to filter this. So we apply the algorithm DB scan. It's a clustering algorithm that uh, takes into account the density distribution of the points and the distance between the distance and the connection between them. So it group it a group the the points. So the only thing left is to loop over the cluster and to see what of this cluster uh, is um, is is appear like a more or less straight line that the, this will be the, the the trajectory of the of the measure the red one in the in the picture of the right, I give you here some some selection of frame. In the in the first column, you have the um, the reference frames uh, processed. Also, in the second, the a detection. In the third, the false positive. In the fourth, you can see the rejected uh, image because it saturates, so we cannot uh, we cannot compute accurately the the fence rate of the um, the, the position of the metroid. A detection, and finally. A detection of the trail of the of the measure. This is a real time processing. Now we need to identify the the star. So uh, first we get uh, we take all the frames that we uh, didn't uh, identify any motion any object motion. So we overlap all this frame in order to reduce the noise and highlight the stars. As you can see in the second um, picture, the the stars are highlighted. So now we apply a logarithmic correction. This is going to improve the um, the the, find the the algorithm that, that we apply to find the the stars. That is a ORB algorithm. This is a corner algorithm. algorithm. It's, a, it's a algorithm that it was thought to find corner, and because the stars appear to be uh, a corner, it works uh, very well. But as you can see, there there are so many false positives, like in the tree. So we need again to filter this point. So we use again the, the cluster algorithm, but in this occasion, instead of work with the cluster, uh, we are uh, interested in the noise, in the points labeled as noise, because the stars appear to be randomly distribu distributed and far from each other. So we take only the, 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 the noise. Also, we, we apply some refraction and aberration and extinction, atmospheric extinction correction. And then we query to the GPL Horizons uh, database the, the real position in the sky of these stars. Once we have uh, this star identified, we need to find a method, a transformation between this, um, this star, this position in the sky, uh, after an altitude topocentric uh, coordinate. 
to um, as a uh, pixel coordinate to topocentric coordinate. So we, uh, first we have two methods. This is the first one. It's a sim more simple method. It's a quadratic model. We need a six reference star, and we can solve with a least square approximation. You can see all this term. This six term are trying to 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 model the um, the the sensor uh, misalignment that can because the optical acid uh, could be not aligned perfectly aligned with the camera, so it could be the, uh, some some error there. So we need um, a, a, a intermediate step. So we need to first compute uh, the, the what uh, the so-called standard uh, coordinate. So and then we need to transform from a pixel coordinate, a standard coordinate, and then uh, the finally the topocentric coordinate. And this term try to model this misalignment and also the deformation that occur when you project uh, the celestial sphere because the celestial sphere uh, appear yeah, to be a uh, even if not, it's not as a, a, a perfect sphere it appears to be a, as a as a sphere and when you project in the, into a frame an image uh, it's a projection to a 2D plane so we are uh, def we are deforming the distortion the the position so we have to take into account this. And also we have another method more complex. It's a very nonlinear method. Uh, it needs uh, to uh, ten reference star. It's very difficult to 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 convert this method. So we need uh, to apply a simple simplex algorithm. That is a method that uh, approaches the um, the best um, initial condition in order to 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 make sure the the convergence. Uh, and we solve it with the power methods. Uh, this method takes into account the, um, the zenithal distance of the optical axis, and also it takes into account, as you can see in the image, a non-symmetrical uh, distortion in the in the image. So finally, that we have this uh, apparent trajectory from each station. Of course, we need uh, two or more stations because when we see the the, the metro from one station, we we don't we, we only see the projection uh, into the celestial sphere. We don't have um, information about the distance, but with a stereoscopy we can reconstruct by combining two or more, uh, especially if they are uh, appropriate separate uh, 20 kilometers or more, we can re uh, reconstruct the, the, the real trajectory. This is done by the method proposed by Tetleja in 1987, the intersection of planes method. As you can see, we have this apparent trajectory from each station, we combine them and we Obtain the, the the atmospheric trajectory that works because the meteor trajectory in the atmosphere, because the, this hypervelocity it can um, it can model it can can be assumed that is a uh, more or less a straight line because the hypervelocity. Uh, so it is why this this method works. And once we have this real trajectory in the atmosphere, we can back propagate. We can back uh, project backward until the collision to the celestial sphere. And get the radians. The, the radian is the position where the the, met, the meteorite uh, appears to come from in the sky. Once we have this radian with the velocity, we can then uh, compute the heliocentric orbit of the of the meteorite. But also we can do it the same way but forward in order to study the meteor fate. You know, but this is a bit more complicated because we need to take we need first to, to, to estimate if it's going to be any metroid uh, survival, if it's a metroid drop or event or not. So we have the, um, all these equations that uh, are based in the single body theory that take into account the drag, the drag of the atmosphere, the lead, and we um, can do a, a model with dimensional, dimensional, dimensionless variables with exclusion of time and assume and um, put all the equation in, in uh, using two terms, alpha and beta. Alpha is the ballistic co uh, coefficient is related with the capability of the metric to penetrate the atmosphere, and beta is the mass loss parameter. Uh, this is a relation between the kinetic energy and the, um, the efficiency of the end on the ablation process. So with this, I'm making some assertion, like some boundary, like no spin at all, uh, or or equal ablation that is a rot uh, enough rotation to equal ablate all the surface of the metric and assuming for example um, a threshold of uh, final mass of 50 grams we can then determine if the the likelihood of the of the metric to to survive the ablation process and once we have 
identify if, if it's a major dropper event, then it will start the, the dark flight. So the, the dark flight, uh, as the name said, it, it, there is no, no more luminous, uh, no, no luminous phenomenon. So, uh, and the, the velocity has decreased a lot. So here, uh, to estimate the, um, the possible area of impact, the so-called stream field, we need to take into account the, the, the wind profile. So on the error calculation, we, we use uh, two experiments. We first uh, do the worst, uh, scenario, uh, worst scenarios um, possible. Um, this is done by assuming the, um, that the points of the apparent trajectory are, are aligned in the worst, uh, in, the, in the way that they deviate the radian the most. And also we double check this, this, this error with a Monte Carlo simulation with the error estimation of the calibration of the lens distortion models. And also the heliocentric uh, orbit, we just uh, propagated it with a um, uh, classical theory of error propagation. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about some study case first and Ursi for a uh, fireball that uh, it happened in, in December of last year, the 22. Of December last year, as you can see here, uh, some video. The one of the legs is not is not a real speed. Um, it was recorded from Sevilla, Alicante, and Murcia, as uh, from the Spanish Meteor Network. And here you can see the in the in the bottom right the the photometric count and velocity. You can see the the green light represents the velocity is decreasing. Uh, a bit and suddenly it uh, go to zero, and at the same time the the photometric count from the third uh, from the three station uh, in, in, in has an, a sharp increase. That is because there is, there is a final uh, arbus, a final explosion of the of the meteor, and that allow us to estimate the tensile strength of the meteor with the density of the atmosphere and the final velocity in the explosion. We can estimate the, sten the stencil strength, and that gives us um, some important clues about the mechanical property of the, of the body. Also, we studied the OSIP um, activity of, of last year with uh, meteor forward scatter techniques. Uh, as you can see in the image of the right, in the top, uh, we, we measure, we, we send a wave, a radio wave, and the meteor trail is going to uh, rebound this, this, this wave and, and the receiver is going to uh, count the number of FECO. And you can see here a comparison between the activity of OSHIP meteor shower from last year and this year. It was expected that at, uh, by Janice Ken in 2006 that uh, um, OSHIP uh, meteor shower of 20 and 2020, it, it, it was going to be uh, uh, very active, but we didn't find these, these arguments. Here you can find the reconstruction of the atmospheric trajectory, and it started uh, uh, more than um, to uh, 110 kilometers and at uh, 34 kilometers. And as you can see, it was we were we estimate that uh, the initial mass was only uh, 43 grams, and it was uh, no final mass estimate. Here you can find a reconstruction in 3D of the um, of the elliptic orbit. As you can see here, the, in pink and purple, the, um, the meteorite orbit with error. And in orange, you can find the parent body that is associated to this uh, meteorite with HD Tuttle comet. And just with, uh, a funny part, as you can see in the, in the picture of the right, that it was a, a very same year, a very same day, that the famous uh, mediatic conjunction of Jupiter uh, Saturn and the Earth, and you can see the alignment in the in the picture there. The right. Okay, so uh, not not all not all um, recorded of meteor are 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 uh, good enough to do the astrometry and to the real data. Some of them are, are only pass partially recorded, or some of them only are recorded from one station. So we need um, to 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 get uh, more data. And we need to use uh, the data uh, from satellite in order to reconstruct the trajectory of this meteor. In order to do that, we have used the CENEOS, the United States uh, sensor, 
the is a satellite, the geostationary lighting mapper, that um, record all, all the flashes of the of the um, Earth, and and they publish the latitude, longitude, and altitude of these flashes and the velocity components of the and the energy of these flashes. So uh, we have recorded one event partially, but we have from satellite data we have this other information we can combine them and this is what we have done we studied in 19 uh, in 2019 this super polite that was as you can see only partially recorded from ibiza or a station from ibiza and um, by an amateur people uh, by a scam video of a car as you can see in the center um, but as you can see it was not possible to do an astrometry with this data because we only see one star at most and in the Costa Brava um, um, picture of the persistent trail we only have the moon so we need uh, um, we need more data so we we implement this um, we extend the, our software capability to 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 implement this to use this satellite data and reconstruct the, the trajectory you can see here the um, the reconstruction of the apparent trajectory on the left and in, on the right, the projection of the apparent trajectory of the on, into the celestial sphere from each stage or from each uh, observation point. You can see that there is some blue and, and red points in the apparent trajectory. I'm going to show you better uh, now. Uh, these are the, the blue with the astrometry from the Ibiza. We we call um, limit the, the the first point, the highest point of the um, atmospheric flight, and the red point. It was a point of maximum, the peak of maximum uh, radiative energy as uh, detected from the space. So, from with these two pictures and and composing all and uh, taking into account all the all the three observation, we reconstruct the atmospheric trajectory. As you can see, the final body, the final mass of, the, of this meteorite, it was estimated to be uh, 190 kilograms. Here you can see an example, of course, the, the elliptic orbit. You can see an, an example, a graphical example of the um, alpha beta criterion that I mentioned before. And as you can see, it was the area of likely of likely fall. Okay, but not all meteor uh, are are natural meteor. Also, we have we have uh, we have to face now the 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 artificial meteor that are uh, produced by, of course, the the development of the of the space exploration, uh, because now we have more um, uh, disposal for the range orbit and end of life of satellite. And when they re-entry, they have to ablate in the atmosphere, and they produce a quite similar event to to meteor. And our station uh, has to deal with with this artificial meteor as well. And also because not only because they have late in the atmosphere because only because uh, also because they reflect just because they reflect the, the light when they are the sunlight when they are in favor, uh, favorable geometries and this is a problem that is increasing because uh, the new mega constellation and we have to we have to face and we have to be aware that this is going to produce a lot of uh, false positive and and also give us the opportunity to to study this this event and also uh, with the new is the sample that i'm going to show you now uh, the new uh, reusable um, rocket like falcon 9 that have a very powerful um rent rent phase that it needs it needs it nice the the engines that um produce a very bright uh, very bright luminous phenomenon and this is what uh, happens, um, and I'm going to explain uh, later uh, with the sample that we, I'm going to show you later. But first, we are going to say uh, tell you how how we can deal with this uh, artificial metal detection. In this case, uh, these artificial metal have a lower velocity, have a curved trajectory, so we cannot apply the the same method of intersection of plane that I mentioned before. We have to we have to we have to adapt this method. In order to 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 reconstruct this trajectory, so uh, we we have to take into account the Earth motion, the, the motion of the of each station because the, this this event has uh, uh, are long uh, long long time. So the the um, the star in the sky 
are moving, so we cannot perform the same uh, easy astrometry. We have to obtain the intercontinental rotation of the point in the, in the in the air, and also we have to chop this um, intersection of, of plane metal. We have to chop it in little uh, straight line that we can compose there all together and fit uh, the heliocentric orbit that uh, the sorry the the Earth orbit that that better fits to this point. You can see here on the on the right. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, we, we had to face with the, uh, this uh, artificial method that was produced by the Falcon 9 upper stage, the orbit. And you can see here the, the, um, the videos as seen from Sevilla, the videos are not re in real speed um, and are overlapped, overlap, overlapping. Um, you can see here from, from Sevilla, from Benny Cassin also, uh, it's, they appear uh, uh, as, a, um, as a polite, very, very bright. And also from, from Sevilla North Station, you can see here the, the, the Falcon and the State two objects and, and down the, the payload, the payload as well, that, that is the Starlink, uh, Starlink constellation that they, are, uh, they were putting in orbit. And also you can see this, this cloud that follows the, 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 the object. This is the Spanish gas cloud. This is a maneuver that is, is usually done by security in order to avoid some explosion before the, the, the orbit. So we were able to, to reconstruct the 3D trajectory. As you can see here, the, the, the orbit, we had to take into account the equilibrium motion, as I said. And you can see in yellow that it was um, uh, uh, lighted by the sun. And, and also we estimate the, um, the, the orbit has a sun by using the, the GMAT, the General Mission Analyze Tool. Of NASA. Here, I present just to, to give you some 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 idea of uh, how the how the three D five torso were looks like. You can see here some some the interface that we are working on, just the for the astrometry, the meteor detection on the on the on the right, the data, the curve velocity, and just to just to give you an idea how the how the software looks. And finally, the in summary. Um, I want to summarize the, 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 the main points that I thought. So the so this software provides a step ahead in metro detection. We apply a uh, new uh, computer vision technique and also uh, we implement different post possible avoidance methods like a uh, clustering algorithm and the common filter. Also, uh, we automate the identification of the star with the this use of the novel corner algorithm. We apply two, met two different methods to correct the FISI uh, distortion. We produce a 3D realistic model for representing the atmospheric trajectory of the light in scale. We also characterize the, um, the, the atmospheric fly and we apply the alpha beta criterion to, to check if it's, to estimate if it's a metric dropping event or not. We, we compute the, the heliocentric orbit, uh, all in all, uh, propagating all the er errors. We, we have a study, uh, the last study, uh, the Ursid meteor activity with one event of the Ursid, uh, one Ursid meteor firewall, sorry. Um, we have demonstrated the ability of the software to implement uh, um, observation, the data from satellite and combine this data with data with ground-based station to, re to reconstruct the meteor trajectory. And also uh, the, we have present the new capacity of the, um, uh, of the software to analyze artificial uh, ball eyes with curved trajectory, and we exempl uh, exemplify this um, this capability with the study of the Falcon uh, Falcon 9 upper stage and the estimation of the the orbit zone. Finally, I want to uh, tell you that we have um, a YouTube channel with dissemination. I want to give you a brief example of uh, what we are um, publishing here in the in the YouTube.
to come follow on YouTube, Twitter. Here you have the reference that uh, we reuse in this work. And that is all from my part. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Eloy, for this really nice, really nice talk. So now it's time for questions. So if anyone has a question, please unmute yourself and ask the question or raise the hand so I can give you the word. So maybe I can start with a question that I have. It's related, you said that you can you can identify these artificial satellites, but my question is how well can you distinguish between them and these meteorites? And if it's a problem, the fact that it looks like this artificial satellite will increase in number a lot in the short term, for example, with the Starling constellation. Mm -hmm. So can you comment on that? Yeah, of course. Um, it's not that difficult because the uh, orbit velocity that has a, a satellite compared with a met with a meteorite into the atmosphere is, is very low. So usually the in the satellite and very uh, low altitude has um, velocity of um, seven kilometers per second, eight kilometers per second, and their their uh, velocity are are. Mm, keep they keep the velocity for the whole flight, or the the, the decrease in the velocity model is very very small, and different the and their their trajectory are curved because they they are following a uh, calcarian motion, and uh, so we have this curved trajectory, low velocity, low decrease of velocity for artificial matter, and for natural matter we have. Um, a straight line, uh, deceleration, very sharp, uh, very pronounced uh, deceleration, and very um, high velocity. So it's more or less easy to, to identify. Then it's more difficult to estimate the, um, the, the orbit of this artificial bolide because it's, as I said, it's curved, it's, uh, very, it's very affected by the drag of the atmosphere. And Related to the problem that is, yeah, we are just in the few months, we are uh, noticing a, a big increase in the number of uh, artificial bolide, artificial methods that we have detected. And all the, all the um, method networks in the world are in the way of automatizing the process of detection. So we have to uh, improve a lot our false positive avoidance if we want to um, our, if we want to monitor monitor uh, the whole sky with full time coverage and we are facing with this all increasing uh, mega constellation we have we, we have to, we will need at least a uh, really good um, 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 false positive method avoidance and also it will be I don't know if we will need um, who knows but if the sky is plenty of of, of a sky, of if the sky is plenty of sat of light spot, uh, if they are increasing in a in a in an aggressive way, we will uh, so we will in a in a point we will not have uh, enough um, enough uh, black sky, uh, clean as clean as sky to study uh, properly the the natural matter. But what yeah, and the natural matter is what is really interesting for for science and to study the solar system and to start to recover the meteorite. To, so I think it, it, it could be a real problem if we don't uh, manage this situation some, somehow. Yeah, indeed. So any other question? I actually have another one. <laughs> so if no one else is asking, I'll, I'll ask another one. And you said that there's to do the reconstruction, you use the, the stars that you see in the camera mm -hmm. that are not the, the meteorite that you're following. Yeah. But in fact, if these cameras are, are like, are like uh, placed in the same place and they are uh, quiet, you could characterize all the stars like doing a, a, some sort of calibration, right? If you don't have to move the camera, you could use all the stars in the sky, in fact. Is that something that you are doing? And uh, yeah, yeah, we we okay. But we only have to calibrate once. If we do a good calibration, and we 
we can convert, we can calibrate the conversion between uh, pixel coordinates to topocentric. That means to azimuth and altitude. This is the point where it's um, pointing the the camera. And once we have, once you have this calibrate, you can always use this this conversion. And then, knowing the date, the time of the event, then convert to to um, to write that expression and declination the position in the sky. Mm -hmm. So you only have to, if you do once, you do a good calibration, you can always use this, this, this calibration. At least you, if you don't touch the camera, of course, if you don't move the camera. Okay. So questions, more questions, anyone? Okay, then if not, if there are no more questions, let's... Thank Eloy again. Thank you, Eloy, for this really nice talk and really nice project. And that's all. And I'll see you in next pizza seminar.